Hello and welcome to The Rules of Investing. I'm your host, David Thornton. Value investing is all about buying stocks that are trading below their intrinsic value. In practical terms, that often involves investing in companies and sectors that have been shunned by the market due to particular macro headwinds. For Tim Carlton, OzCap Asset Management CIO and today's guest on The Rules of Investing, it's the cyclical parts of the market that are offering value amidst high inflation and high rates. In today's episode, Tim runs through two retail stocks in the OzCap Long Short Australian Equities Fund that fit this profile. I won't give them away, but one is the only stock on the ASX with a return on equity above 50% while the other is a long-term compounder poised to take market share. He also discusses why he's avoided the tech and energy sectors, what he expects from earnings season, why he doesn't put much weight in earnings beats and misses, and why lithium is investable despite being crowded. If you're an Apple Podcast or Spotify user, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. Or if you're a LiveWire subscriber, hit the follow button at the bottom of the wire to get notified whenever we post new content. Not a subscriber yet? Head over to livewiremarkets.com. It's free to sign up and you'll get access to the leading investment minds from Australia and abroad. All right, Tim, thanks for joining us on the Rules of Investing. Thanks for having me. Right. It seems like not long ago we were talking about narrow roads to soft landings, but now it seems like a soft landing has become the base case. What changed? Well, I guess the the biggest thing is that um, inflation appears to have peaked globally. And we saw in uh, the US inflation peak in core terms in the third quarter or towards the end of the third quarter last year. And if you look historically, uh, over the last 100 years, there's been five previous occurrences where inflation has risen to above 7% uh, and uh, the market has sold off um, considerably as a result of that. Well, if you take the average response to those five occurrences, uh, the market has bottomed when inflation has peaked. So in many senses, uh, what the US market is doing at the moment is analogous to what it's done previously when you've seen a spike in inflation. It's it's, bo- it's, it's fallen as inflation has risen rapidly, it's bottomed as inflation's peaked, and it's rallied as inflation has continued to come off that peak. So that's what we're seeing at the moment. We don't think it's um, particularly unusual in a historical context. Um, we anticipate that um, inflation will uh, continue to be moderate compared to the peaks we saw at the end of last year. Uh, and as a result, people are getting more comfortable now that we're seeing more economic data points that uh, the economy has actually handled uh, that uh, uh, high level of inflation and as a result, high interest rates, uh, perhaps uh, more comfortably than the market had previously anticipated. So you're an Aussie equities fund manager. Um, what's your base case here at home? We don't have any view on the direction of the market. What we would say is that if you uh, compare valuations today to uh, uh, where they have been historically, uh, the Australian market is roughly in line with its long-term cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. So it's neither cheap nor expensive. That being said, there are certainly pockets of opportunity uh, and there are other parts of the market that we consider to be more expensive. So it should be no surprise as to where... uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pockets of opportunity are. They're in the more cyclical sectors that uh, people are most concerned about from an earnings perspective. Uh, and so earnings season will give people some clarity and maybe some confidence to, uh, to dip their toe back into um, those parts of the market. And the more expensive parts are the more defensive um, sectors. So uh, the consumer staple space, uh, IT, uh, healthcare, and they're generally the sectors that you're seeing us steer clear of or certainly have a lower exposure to because there simply isn't the um, the value and opportunity um, there that we're seeing in the other parts of the market. On reporting season, it's just kicking off now. Um, what do you expect from it and what are you watching most closely? Well, we're, we're most heavily focused on the companies that we're invested in and uh, we want to understand how they are developing their business. There are going to be uh, some companies that will, over the next couple of years, see a decline in in their earnings, um, 
particularly in the retail space, because a lot of them benefited from uh, a lift in consumption uh, as we emerged from COVID and uh, relatively benign uh, uh, cost structures. And now obviously that's inverted. The to generate revenue growth is a little more difficult and they're seeing their cost base increase as wages increase, property costs increase uh, and they have inflation in other parts of the supply chain. Uh, so there is going to be um, some pressure on the earnings of some of the companies that we're invested in. But um, I think the market will look through that. The market's very good at uh, looking forward and in the same way that uh, prices uh, for many of these retailers fell very strongly in the first half of 2022. Um, uh, they're going to be looking for a sign that uh, they can see the trough in earnings and uh, uh, have an expectation around what those companies will be able to deliver from that point forward. And what really matters to us is the earnings growth over the next five to ten years. Because ultimately, um, while you can have short-term deviations from the earnings of a business – a business is only worth what uh, it generates in cash flow over its lifetime. So understanding what that cash flow profile is going to look like, understanding the earnings growth on a go-forward basis is the most important thing in valuing a business. So we will have a reasonably strong opinion about where earnings are likely to trend over the next five to ten years and what we want to see is um, uh, our uh, investments um, delivering uh, – reasonable earnings growth over the medium term uh, and uh, we know that if they do that that the share prices will reflect that earnings growth over time and that's what's going to deliver the returns for our, uh, our unit holders. Just looking at you quarterly it looks like you've got a little bit of dry powder a bit over five percent in cash. Um, what kind of company would you buy or buy more of um, if the market took an overly pessimistic view on it through earnings season? Well, it's, it's probably a question that reflects the part of the market that we look at. So as a general principle, we're looking for companies that have uh, a high return on invested capital. Um, we would classify those sorts of businesses as high-quality businesses. Why are they high-quality businesses? Well, if you have two businesses and one is able to deliver a 25% return on the capital it invests, so it invests $100 and it's able to generate $25 in earnings every year from that $100 invested. And it has a it has a competitor and that competitor, when it invests the same $100, only earns $10 in after-tax profits from that $100 investment. That That's telling you that there's some sort of competitive advantage that company A has that company B doesn't have. Uh, and so it's our job to then figure out what that is. Uh, in some instances, it's fairly, fairly obvious. So if you take a company like car sales, it has a very dominant position in the market. It has all of the vendors, all of the dealers use the site. It has the vast bulk of the customers. And as a result, it not only has economies of scale, but it has pricing power. And so it delivers considerably higher returns on invested capital than its much smaller peers that it's competing against, particularly in the Australian market. In in other situations, it's a more complicated process to work out what that competitive advantage is. We often use um, Nick Scali as the example because it has a long-term return on equity of north of 50%. It's the only company in the market to exhibit that characteristic. Now, what is its competitive advantage against a lot of its peers? Well, that's a more complicated and nuanced question to answer. But what return on capital metrics tell you is they give you an indication that a company has some sort of competitive advantage and our job is to go and work out what that competitive advantage is, whether it's sustainable, whether it's growing or whether it's shrinking. And if we find a company with a, uh, a strong competitive advantage where we think that that competitive advantage, that moat is increasing over time and we get an opportunity to buy that business at a reasonable or better valuation, they're the sorts of companies that uh, we're looking to invest in. So if we see um, an overreaction or what we perceive to be an overreaction to um, some sort of short-term volatility in earnings or um, uh, a one-off incident that affects the company's share price but we know doesn't change the long-term trajectory of the earnings of, of that company, they're the sort of businesses that we'll look to, um, to either add to our exposure in or initiate a position if we're not already there. 
You talk in the newsletter about stock prices following earnings. How much weight do you put in beats and misses? Not a huge amount, uh, if I was being completely honest. Uh, there, um, there's a bit of a game that's played in the market, um, and some companies play the game uh, and often attract a higher uh, price to earnings multiple, and they, they, they deliberately set expectations reasonably low, uh, and then they consistently come in ahead of um, those expectations. Other companies are more realistic about their guidance, guidance so they'll, they'll, they'll beat guidance 50% of the time and they'll miss guidance 50% of the time. So you might have two companies that um, both deliver 10% comp and earnings growth over time. Uh, one of them says they're going to do 10% earnings growth and so they miss or beat about equal number of times and the other one says they're going to do 5% earnings growth and they constantly beat uh, expectations and the latter company tends to trade for a higher multiple than the former company. What we're interested in is um, is businesses that generate that strong earnings growth trajectory over time and um, then buying into those businesses at a valuation that we find attractive. So uh, we're going to be focused on the quality of the result, what's affected the result, um, what the business is doing to um, continue to expand their operations and grow earnings into the future. And that's uh, far more our focus than, um, than you know whether they've slightly beaten or missed um, consensus expectations. We'll certainly have a view as to whether uh, we think that the market is too optimistic or too pessimistic in relation to um, the earnings number in the current year. And that may slightly impact the size of the position that we'll have within the fund. But it's more important for us to get the, the stocks right, the, the, the companies are investing in right. Um, and we try to be very specific around the sorts of companies that we'll invest in in the first instance. So you, you tend not to see a huge number of um, name changes for the stocks that we report in our top 20, and that's because we tend to be very long-term investors. Once we've decided that we like a business and that we've got into a business at a valuation we find attractive, then we tend to be invested in that business for a very long period of time. Let's dig into your approach. It focuses on, quote, long investments in high quality companies that have a sustainable competitive advantage and are trading at prices below their long-term intrinsic value. How does that translate into processes and filters day to day? Hmm. Well, well, from a high quality perspective, we've talked about return on capital metrics being indicative of a sustainable competitive advantage. Um, so we will then have a view as to what we anticipate, anticipate the company will deliver in terms of future cash flows and, um, uh, that will determine our valuation for the business. Um, uh, companies with higher growth rates deserve to trade on higher multiples. Companies with lower gro- growth rates deserve to trade on lower multiples. So um, there's no simple answer in terms of a particular PE or a, um, a particular valuation at which um, uh, we will find um, every company attractive. It's more um, uh, a, a function of the outlook for that particular company, what we anticipate its growth in earnings will be over time, uh, that will determine our valuation. So in some instances, we'll be more than happy to pay 20 times for a business that we think is growing very quickly and is very high quality and has abundant opportunities in front of it. Um, if if a company doesn't have those characteristics, that's not to say we won't be interested. Um, we'll just be uh, more price conscious in terms of um, investing in that particular business. But certainly if the company doesn't have a strong track record in terms of delivering um, good returns on capital from money that it invests, uh, we will tend to avoid the company altogether um, because as good as some management teams are, it's very difficult to turn a poor business into a great one. Um, so we we try to find great businesses and, and stick to that as our universe. The long short fund returned over 21% in financial year 23 and it did so with a massive overweight exposure to consumer disc. How did that pan out? It's not the first thing that springs to mind when you think of a world of high inflation and high rates. Yeah, and incredibly really. Uh, when we looked at our sector attribution for the financial year 23, uh, consumer discretionary was actually the biggest contributor to returns. And what it tells you is that the market is reasonably forward-looking and the lift in interest rates uh, 
was factored in into the decline that we saw for a lot of the consumer discretionary companies in the first half of calendar year 22 or the second half of the financial year 22. Uh, and so despite the fact that we've had 10 interest rate rises in 11 meetings from the RBA in financial year 23, um, the consumer stocks that we're invested in actually performed quite strongly for us. Uh, and uh, that's what markets do. They, they look forward six to 12 months. They anticipate um, both upward and down movements. And so at this point, um, uh, you know, I think investors are starting to look through the trough in earnings and the trough in economic activity that's likely to come from the significant lift in interest rates that we've seen. And they're starting to look to the growth on the other side of that. And it's important to remember that at the end of the day, valuation matters and investors, once they think they have some sort of clarity about where a trough in earnings is likely to land, they will start to price in the recovery from that point. M- markets often have a way of um, overreacting to information, and they do this on both the positive side and the negative side. Uh, Howard Marks has, rec- has, has uh, reasonably often talked about uh, the pendulum uh, or you know, in terms of uh, investor sentiment, there's huge swings from extreme optimism to extreme pessimism. And the pendulum doesn't have to swing all of the way. It can swing back to the centre from extreme pessimism and then move back to extreme pessimism. And I suggest that that's what we've seen with a lot of retail names over the last um, two or three years because everyone knew that there was this incredible lift in um, consumption in certain categories as we emerged from... COVID and the market has ever since been expecting a significant um, retraction in um, in the earnings for the businesses that that won from that Um, and in both directions um, the market can move too far so um, you know at the moment we suspect that the market's become too pessimistic about the earnings outlook for uh, a lot of the retailers um, but time will tell we're about to go into reporting season and uh, quite a number of companies are going to report what they have seen in this period where there's been this great uncertainty mortgage holders um, have obviously been suffering as interest rates have risen from uh, practically nothing to over four percent and um, and that's going to play a part in um, uh, earnings being lower for um, uh, for quite a number of retailers than they have been in recent years but at the end of the day, it's valuation that, that matters and it's the future cash flows that each of these businesses are going to go generate that is going to determine whether there's a compelling opportunities in the market at the moment or not. Our view is that there is. So you hold JB Hi-Fi and, as you mentioned earlier, Nick Scarly, two companies that definitely enjoyed the COVID sugar hit as people were you know, locked down mm-hmm. and wanted to buy a so- an extra sofa and and buy some more tallies, I suppose. A lot of analysts have worried about cycling um, these purchases. I guess, you know, there's only so many TVs and sofas that people can fill their house up with. Do you share that concern? We're realistic about the fact that earnings are likely to decline from where they have been. Um, But that's not the real question. The question is whether that's already priced into stocks. So to use JB Hi-Fi as an example, I think last year they produced net profit after tax of over $540 million. Well, the market for next year has them uh, producing about $370 million. So that's a very, very substantial decline. So from this point, the stock will most likely react um, to news depending on whether the likely outcome is going to be higher or lower than that outcome. Now, we think that outcome is already reasonably pessimistic. It might turn out to be the case, but if it is the case, the stock's trading trading on approximately 12 times um, that earnings number. So uh, the market's already factored in a significantly lower earnings profile, and it's put the stock on a depressed multiple of that uh, of those earnings. And so, to us, that presents an opportunity, particularly in a name like JB Hi-Fi, which has a tremendous um, track record in terms of delivering compound earnings growth. Um, they've got a a great record in terms of return on equity. They've taken market share from their peers uh, most years over the last 20 years, and there's still a considerable opportunity, we think, um, to take more market share. They're in a category which I think broadly we would expect to continue to grow. Um, uh, We don't need to be specific around what products you or I are going to be buying in the next five years, but 
we are happy to take a view that in five and ten years' time there are, there's going to be more gadgetry in our homes than less, which means that we'll be spending most likely a bigger percentage of our income um, uh, with companies like JB Hi-Fi rather than a smaller percentage. Um, we've got very, very strong population growth in um, this country, which actually uh, determines the volume of goods bought much more than swings in sentiment, uh, which I think is um, the opposite to uh, a lot of people's expectations. So, um, so you know, the decline in earnings that we've seen uh, is being – sorry, that we're going to see – has been priced in by the market. And from this point, it will be whether um, the earnings that these companies are able to deliver – are higher or lower than the current expectations within the market as to whether um, these companies will uh, uh, will see price rises or, or or falls in terms of their stock price. Just looking at the portfolio, you have no exposure to tech and very little to energy, um, two sectors that have generated a bit of alpha the past year. Why do you guys steer clear? In the technology space, uh, there's a mix of companies. Some we wouldn't put in the high quality camp. Um, there's a number of companies that haven't been able to demonstrate that they've delivered um, cash generation over time. And experience tells us that it's very, very difficult for a company to go from losing money to generating large amounts of money. It, it, it very, very rarely happens. It's almost a cultural um, thing within an organisation. So we would steer clear of businesses that uh, have a habit of losing cash and coming back to shareholders to continue their operations. Um, the companies that do generate significant amounts of cash are trading on tremendous multiples. So um, it is difficult for us as a value investor to get a, our head around paying the sorts of multiples that the market's paying for those companies, particularly in an, in an environment in which you know interest rates are a lot higher than they have been. And that should flow through to lower overall market multiples. And yet, for many of these companies, they haven't seen their multiple retrace in the way that we would have expected given interest rates are, are now north of 4%. Um, so um, that, that would explain our tech uh, underweight. On the, on the energy side, it, it's uh, more a case of um, uh, insufficient companies in the market that meet our um, quality uh, and valuation characteristics that um, we're reasonably firm about. Uh, so, uh, again, if you look at the track records of a number of the companies within the domestic market, their long-term track records in terms of capital allocation or returns on capital have been reasonably poor. Uh, and uh, and as a result, we haven't found a huge number of opportunities in that space that we think are attractive enough to put our investor ca- our investors' capital to work. Now, mineral resources is one of your top holdings. Is that a thematic EV play or just a company-specific play or both? It's company-specific. We've owned um, mineral resources for a long time. Uh, today it has four businesses. So its traditional business uh, is mining services. Uh, and uh, then it has three commodity businesses. It's lithium business, which is the EV business that you're talking about. Um, it has an iron ore business and it has an energy business. And certainly the largest component of valuation, probably by some way um, today, is the lithium business. Uh, It made a very smart move um, over the last decade to get involved in lithium. It owns two very high-quality hard rock deposits in Australia, which we think um, are, you know, the tier one, uh, two of the tier one um, global lithium assets. And uh, given the... Uh, excess demand for for lithium that we think is likely to persist um, at least for the next decade. Um, We we expect very, very strong pricing uh, on the lithium products that they uh, mine, and that's exactly what we're seeing. And as a result, um, those assets are generating tremendous amounts of cash for MIN uh, and for other companies that are in that sweet spot of being current producers of of lithium. So... um, uh, we remain quite excited about the opportunity in front of them. They're going to expand their lithium output quite significantly. Um, but we're also quite excited about uh, the other parts of their business. Their mining services business is likely to double in the next five years. Um, they have a, an iron ore operation that's going to go from a high-cost operation to a much larger, lower-cost operation. 
and they've got an emerging energy business which we think is going to supply gas into their own projects and into the WA market uh, potentially for decades um, that uh, uh, we don't think is being valued at all um, in the current share price. So um, we're quite excited about um, uh, that particular business. They have a wonderful track record in terms of return on capital. Um, They've delivered north of 20% return on capital uh, on average since they listed, which is extraordinary for a mining and mining services business. Um, they're founder-led, which is another big focus of ours. You know, um, something like 70% of the businesses that we're invested in are founder-led. And um, the advantage of founder-led businesses um, has, been, uh, has been demonstrated by companies like Min, where they take advantage of every opportunity. They took advantage of a small opportunity to, to pick up those lithium assets um, uh, in the last decade, and they've turned out to be uh, incredible investments for the company that um, you know are going to spill out um, many billions of dollars in free cash flow for Min uh, in the coming years. So uh, we are very excited about the EV thematic. Um, it's going to lead to uh, excess demand um, over supply for a number of commodities, but lithium's probably at the pointy end um, of that imbalance. Quite a lot of your peers who join us on Livewire have flagged lithium as a crowded trade. I take it you disagree? No, it probably is a crowded trade in the domestic market. Um, but at the end of the day, share prices will follow earnings. So uh, the market can be right, and the majority can be right about a particular thematic, um, is the first point that I'll make. So th- th- there is no sense in being contrarian for the sake of it. Um, if a business is going to generate um, a lot of money and a, and a growing amount of money over time and is trading on an attractive valuation relative to the cash flow that it's going to generate, then the market will factor that in over time. The second point I'd make is, while it's crowded in Australia, I suspect it's a whole lot less crowded globally. And uh, when you look at the electric vehicle um, uh, demand uh, and supply drivers for uh, different commodities... Lithium probably has the most favourable um, uh, demand supply imbalance on a go forward basis. And we're very focused on that in Australia because Australia dominates the lithium supply globally. So Australia is responsible for more than 50% of the world's lithium. And uh, uh, so that makes it, you know, in some sense comparable to iron ore. I think that share is likely to grow over time, not decline because we are very good at getting mining operations up and running and uh, with the lithium price uh, exploding as it's done, there is now a huge focus on finding additional resources within Australia and you're seeing quite a number of junior companies have significant success uh, on that front. But even under very, very optimistic assumptions around new supply coming on, it's very difficult to see how supply will keep up with demand growth. And the result of that is you get um, uh, prices that are well above the cost of production for uh, all of the existing producers and particularly for the tier one producers. And Min is a tier one producer. So um, the consensus can be right. I think when investors globally think about um, the lithium companies that they would like to own to have exposure to this thematic long term, they're going to focus on Um, a number of the Australian businesses in particular, uh, uh, because uh, I think they're going to be the most proficient um, producers and um, they're going to generate the highest margins of any of the um, lithium producers globally. Uh, So we we remain pretty excited and while we're wary uh, of um, the fact that it's a somewhat consensus trade in the domestic market, we just need to remind ourselves that at the end of the day, it will be the earnings that these companies are able to generate over time that matter far more than uh, whether in the near term uh, the majority of domestic investors uh, own these businesses. Let's finish with our three favourite questions. Um, Question one, what's one thing investors are getting wrong about today's market? I think broadly investors and the broader market is very good at getting things right. Um, But the market also has certain characteristics And one of those characteristics which we've discussed, we try to use to our advantage and we call it time horizon arbitrage because the market is fixated on what's happening in the next six to 12 months. 
and that's about as far as they are willing to look. Uh, so if we can have a longer term horizon and uh, buy businesses when they're attractively priced compared to our expectations over the medium to long term, that gives us an opportunity to buy into some great businesses at very attractive prices, despite the fact that in many instances, the reason they're at a great price is because the near term looks challenging, right? Particularly as it relates to some sort of broad macroeconomic um, a headwind that um, is hitting that particular company hard at that point in time. So we'll try to look a little further out and say, well, if we take a mid-cycle view of earnings, are we paying an attractive price to invest into this high-quality business at this point? And if the answer is yes, then we'll start accumulating um, that particular stock. So we try to use the characteristic of the market to our advantage, and we could expand that to a whole number of characteristics where that we've written about in, in our historic newsletters where uh, we recognise that the market reacts in a particular way and it's really our job to try to use um, those reactions to our investors' advantage. When you're looking at beyond what the market is, so beyond that six to 12-month time horizon, obviously you know, the further out you're looking, the more variables, unknown variables uh, are introduced. Um, does that ever come back and bite you? Well, I'd, I'd probably um, phrase it slightly differently. In the short term, um, it's more likely that the um, current economic environment is going to significantly influence um, each company that's operating in a particular sector. So at the moment, if you're in retail, it's hard to ignore the fact that interest rates have just risen so substantially, and that's going to have uh, the most pronounced impact on earnings in the coming year. Right? But if I look forward five years, things that the companies are doing inside their businesses are going to have a far more important um, impact on their result in five years' time than the cumulative effect of the economic conditions over the next five years. So the advantage of taking a medium to long-term time horizon is you become far more focused about what the company is doing rather than trying to second-guess the impossible. You screen out the, the noise. You screen out the which is exactly, which is trying to guess where the economy is going in the next six to 12 months. So uh, we would say it's focusing on the things that we think the company can, tr can, can control and that we can have an informed opinion about and trying to remove uh, any attempt we might want to have on guessing what the macro environment is going to be within the next year. Question two, could you share a story of a big win or a big loss or both um, in your investing career? What happened and what did you learn from it? Sure. Well, why don't we, you always learn more from, uh, from your losses than from your wins. Um, so why don't we start there? I mean, I, I think broadly losses fall into three categories and people mostly focus on the first category and that is companies that you invested in that then went poorly. Um, but there are um, two other categories that are probably just as important. Um, one, investments that you should have made that you didn't um, for a reason that you recognise um, uh, is not valid um, over the long term. And then the third one is investments that you made that were right that you then uh, exited because you were worried about um, something that was happening in the short term. Um, so... Uh, if I think about the first category, uh, we invested in Unibail, uh, or we were invested in Unibail. Um, uh, they have the largest um, high-quality collection of shopping centre assets globally, um, obviously significantly impacted by COVID. Um, but in a post-COVID world, uh, um, we knew that they would see a recovery and the share price was assuming an 8 to 10% capitalisation rate, which looked to us far too high. They had a very, very long debt maturity profile, so we knew they were, they were not at risk of um, running out of capital uh, to service um, uh, the debt or get through um, the period um, immediately post-COVID. Um, and uh, they were run, or they'd been, um, they'd seen a management change and, and a very, very experienced operator had come in and taken place of the, um, taken the place of the previous management team they uh, the board had invested very, very heavily into the company. Um, they'd bought nearly 20% of the shares on issue. 
And so we were very confident about the trajectory, but we did realise that their debt was too high. They had gearing above 40%. Um, but we'd made the assumption that uh, uh, they would get that down over time because they had such long debt maturities. And as business recovered, as it invariably has, uh, retail is back in vogue in shopping centres and they own the best collection of shopping centres globally. We have an adage that we had put to one side, which is, you know, debt, too much debt can kill even the best of companies. Um, and it's a reminder that you shouldn't put your rules to one side um, unless um, there's a very, very clear path to um, uh, to them coming back uh, into the realms of what you would consider to be uh, reasonable on a particular measure. And in this instance, we never anticipated that interest rates would rise so quickly coming out of COVID. And as cool, of course, they have done so. You've got a cash rate in the US at the moment that's north of 5%. Well, their property portfolio is valued based on an initial yield of 4.9. Now, obviously, if you can get a risk-free return with the US government that's north of 5, the shopping centres shouldn't be valued on an initial yield of 4.9. And um, that creates complications because all of a sudden that means that as asset prices drop, their leverage, which is already too high, increases substantially. So we, we exited that investment um, when that rise in interest rates became obvious um, at a loss. So certainly it's a reminder that if you um, have rules around the way that you invest in businesses, um, be very, very careful about discarding those rules. Um, the second one is is probably a bigger error in many ways. Um, when we started the fund, we could see a very, very long track record, sorry, a very, very long um, growth opportunity for REA. Um, we knew that they were going to compound earnings growth at 15 to 20% for probably the next de- decade. Um, there were so many opportunities. They were so dominant in that market. And yet we were held back by the fact that at the time the PE was 20. And the the main reason for that was we were concerned that, well, what happens if the PE drops from 20 to 16? We'll see a 20% loss on our investment. That could happen almost immediately. Uh, And we let that prevent us from investing in what we knew was a tremendous business, great return on equity, a huge number of opportunities for organic growth at very, very high incremental rates of return. And uh, and that's cost us significantly. Um, And the analysis that we should have done is, well, let's say we're right about the earnings profile, uh, which we were very confident on. Um, if, If the multiple does drop to 16 and stay there for the 10 years... On our analysis, it was still going to deliver us a 15% compound return, which is very attractive for that sort of business. If that's your downside scenario, that's an investment that you should make. And we didn't make it, and we didn't make it um, precisely because I was worried about um, the fact that we might get a derating in the multiple. And so, uh, as I said at the start, you have to consider multiples in the context of the quality of the business, its likely growth over time. And that was one instance where I turned what should have been an advantage in terms of time horizon arbitrage. Do we want to own this for the next 10 years? Will it generate a great return for us even under a pessimistic um, set of scenarios? Um, The answer is yes. Um, So we should have invested, but I didn't because I was worried about the super short term, which is turning an advantage into a disadvantage. And then the last example I'll I'll give you is... um, is actually a market darling at the moment. We talked about mineral resources, but actually um, at the end of quarter one in 2019, we invested in Pilbara and um, it had just commenced production. Uh, We knew the price of lithium was depressed, uh, but we were very firm on our opinion that over the next decade it was going to have, um, uh, there was going to be excess demand over supply in the market and we could see all the hallmarks of that. We'd seen one previous run-up in price in 2017, 2018. The price had come off significantly. And so as they started production, we'd removed the uh, construction risk out of the equation and we had a small investment. And the lithium price sort of kept it drifting slightly lower. So actually, we exited that investment. Uh, I think we bought it in the 60s and we exited not far from that. And we felt pretty good about ourselves. Um, as the lithium price kept going south. And I think eventually the stock got to about 15 cents, might have even been slightly lower than that. And as the lithium price then started to recover, we just never revisited. Um, and that was a mistake because we knew it was a tier one asset. Um, and, uh, you know, in hindsight, obviously, 
not exiting uh, would have been um, at least one strategy that would have delivered a very, very considerable gain um, to our investors. But um, uh, it was it was one that we, we didn't, despite the fact that actually we got a lot of the fundamental analysis right. And uh, again, that, that sort of mistake um, is just as costly in many ways as the ones that you make that um, detract from your return. So there's there's different types of mistakes that you can make and we're... Um, we think we're probably more um, uh, accurate in avoiding um, mistake number one in, in terms of investing in companies that we shouldn't be invested in, certainly than um, um, compared to 2012. Our, our field, uh, the universe that we're happy to play in is a lot smaller than it was 10 years ago. Um, and so sometimes we have to be more careful about um, not making mistakes two and three where you know that there is a great business that's going to deliver tremendous earnings growth over time, you know, the REAs of the future, um, REA, its earnings went up, I think, four and a half times from 2012 to 2022. Um, and trying to be um, a little less focused on price and the way you adjust for that is position size. So, you know, we have some investments in the fund where um, we think the price is a little bit too high, but the position size that we have for that stock is smaller. And that gives you a different frame of reference, a different way of thinking about that stock. So if if the stock does fall uh, and it's a 2% position, we become less worried about the impact on the performance of the fund and more excited about the fact that, okay, now we can take it to a 3 to 4% position or more if it's a, if it's a very compelling opportunity. So um, where we see a very good business that's trading um, on a slightly elevated price-to-earnings multiple – but where we one where we think that there is a very very long trajectory of strong compound earnings growth, we will tend to invest in that business today to try to avoid that sort of mistake that we've used historically. And then if you get a sell off, um, that gives you an opportunity to add. You make sure you take advantage of it. Which do you find um, more difficult or more challenging between the buyer side and the sell side? Um, or do you not distinguish between the two in the sense that you're applying the same processes? You're applying the same processes in the sense that you have a view about the earnings trajectory of a business over time and occasionally the market will get excited and um, the stock will move far ahead of the earnings profile or the earnings trajectory of that company. And if it moves considerably away from that line, then we will reduce our position. Now, we don't like doing that, but we simply recognise that um, the fundamentals have not kept pace with the stock price. So to use an example, as we emerge from COVID, um, Reese uh, went from its you know historic um, trading range from a multiple perspective up to 30 to 40 times. And it, it got to a price where we just couldn't justify the position. So it, it went from being a 3 to 4% position down to about a half a percent position simply because we thought that the stock has moved a long way away from the underlying earnings growth that we expect this stock will deliver over time, right? And, of course, subsequent to that, the stock price halves and it's back to a reasonably normal multiple and we get an opportunity to take it back to the previous sort of uh, position size, 3 to 4%. Um, so we don't like doing that because we like being very long-term investors. It's the reason we didn't go to zero in that particular stock. Um, but we will trim where a stock moves considerably ahead of its fundamentals and similarly we'll have a view on um, companies where the stock price is depressed and the valuation has moved well south of where it should be given the long-term um, earnings profile of that business and you know most of those opportunities at the moment look to be uh, to us in in the retail space where people are so fixated on the next year's uh, on next year's earnings um, that they're forgetting about the the long earnings growth that many of these companies will exhibit thereafter. Question three, and I've got to preface by saying this is purely a hypothetical, but if markets were to close tomorrow for five years and you could only own shares in one company, what company would that be and why? The company would be Nick Scarly. Uh, I mentioned them briefly earlier in the discussion, uh, uh, but it has the three characteristics we like to see. Uh, it has a very, very... Um, strong track record in terms of return on capital. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's the only business on the ASX to have a an average ROE over the last 10 years exceeding 50%. So that's better than the REAs and the car sales of the world, which is somewhat extraordinary. And 
they've done it um, mostly ungeared. So uh, they have held net cash for, uh, I think, nine of those ten years that I'm referring to, uh, which makes it even more extraordinary. Um, they have a very, very long runway of potential organic and inorganic growth. So they used the windfall proceeds from COVID to buy plush. They've made some very, very dramatic changes in to that plush network. Um, we should start to see that through come through in the next couple of results where you'll see margins from the plush business expand very, very considerably. Um, so they've removed the promotions, they've changed 50% of the range, they've changed the pricing profile, they've changed how they source the products, which has had the uh, double win of both improving the product, uh, lowering the cost to the consumer, while also improving their own margins, which is somewhat extraordinary. Um, and from this point, uh, they have an opportunity to grow the store network, both for the traditional Nick Scully brand and the plush brand. So there's an opportunity to probably double the store network across both brands over the next decade or so. And that's what you want to find before we talk about valuation. You want to find a business that has a great rec record in terms of when they invest a million dollars, they deliver a tremendous return on that capital in terms of earnings that flow from that million dollar investment. Well, it's hard to find a company that's got a better track record than Nick Scully does on that front. And it has a lot of organic, organic opportunities to do exactly that. Um, and then you combine that with valuation. Well, everyone is fixated on... Um, the unwind of the COVID spend where apparently we all bought a couch. Actually, ABS volumes um, for furniture suggest that that's not the case and that actually, as we sit here today, we're below trend in terms of the volume of couches that are being purchased, which is probably unsurprising because the two um, biggest drivers of furniture volumes are housing turnover and um, housing development. Well, housing starts at the moment are particularly weak, and as REA will tell you, the second half of last calendar year, so the second half of 2022, saw the lowest um, uh, volume of listings, which relates to housing turnover, that they have seen in 20 years, in absolute terms, despite the fact that you've had strong population growth over those 20 years. So that is somewhat remarkable. So volumes to us actually look below trend. Now, they may well fall further below trend, but if we take a medium-term time horizon with this business, we think it's on an incredibly depressed multiple of what through the cycle earnings look like. So you've got a business with a great ROE, a long runway for growth, um, and a very attractive valuation. And uh, uh, it's certainly a business um, that we'd want to own for five years. It's found run. Uh, Anthony Scarley is a tremendous retailer. He's got a strong team around him. Uh, and we're excited for what the future holds in terms of uh, 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 that business and, and how they uh, manage to grow it over the next five to ten years. Well, on that, that note, we'll leave it there. Tim, thanks so much for joining us on the Rules of Investing. Thanks very much. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Tim Carlton. If you did, please give it a like and remember to sign up for free to livewiremarkets.com. I'll see you next time.